It is such a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this event, and it's a very special showcasing of Dean Miguel Garcia Garibay's research. Um, I'm Kathy Clark. I had the distinct pleasure of being chair when Miguel was dean, which made it mildly bearable. <laughs> and um, after that, I served as associate dean of special events. And then the pandemic hit, and the special events became really special. <laughs> so Miguel has served as dean of the Division of Physical Sciences since 2016. And he served as senior dean of the College of Letters and Science since November 2022. Miguel, as you all know, I'm sure, is extremely proud of the Division of Physical Sciences. And this division, just because Miguel would say this if he were introducing, <laughs> is composed of atmospheric and oceanic sciences, chemistry and biochemistry, earth, planetary, and space sciences, mathematics, physics and astronomy, and statistics and data science. I think I got them all, right? <laughs> It's also home to four interdisciplinary institutes, including the Institute of Environment and Sustainability, as well as 17 affiliate research centers and, and institutes. So I need notes to recount all this. Miguel doesn't. <laughs> as Dean Miguel has provided incredibly thoughtful and strategic leadership, he's developed a culture of cooperation and inclusion and during his tenure, he's expanded the division's academic offerings, led multiple collaborations in research and inclusive teaching, and has invested in the student experience. So I'd like to indulge in a bit of background about Miguel. He joined the UCLA chemistry and biochemistry faculty in 1992 after doing postdoctoral research at Columbia, which followed his PhD studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada. He obtained his BS degree at the University of Michoacan in Mexico. Did I do OK on that? <laughs> in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Miguel quickly rose through the ranks to become a distinguished professor. He served as vice chair for education and then as chair. And during his time as chair, Miguel developed and then taught Chem 147, which is careers in chemistry and biochemistry. This course is still held every quarter, and Miguel, while he was chair, taught it every quarter. This course enables our undergraduate majors to learn about careers that are possible if they get a degree in chemistry or biochemistry. And it has synergized the interactions of our undergraduate majors with our alumni and with our development staff. However, we're here today because Miguel has not only remained active as a scientist, he has set the bar for being one of our most incredibly successful and distinguished research professors. He's authored over 230 articles and delivered over 450 lectures worldwide. Among his many accolades, he's been elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Chemical Society. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Mexican Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. And he was the recipient of the 2023 OSPER Award. That's a Cincinnati Distinguished <clears throat> Award. So today we have the very unique opportunity to hear from Miguel talk about his science. And for a wonderful change, we're all looking forward to hearing about your research. So thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, I have to say that I'm really, really happy to see all of you here. It is such a special occasion. So th this is actually sir, the, an, an, an idea that came from, uh, from the Physical Sciences uh, Advisory Board. Uh, you know, we were meeting twice a year, getting a lot of good ideas, and, and uh, somehow they, they got 
understood that I was still doing research and that seemed to be unusual. So our development team, that I'm very grateful for, decided to organize uh, this uh, ad because of the request of our advisory board. So th thank you all of those, uh, all of you who are here. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so it's, it's rare that you, you get to give a scientific talk to a broad audience and preparing a talk for a broad audience is always a little challenging. So, but I think I'll have you remember some of your general chemistry today, <laughs> <laughs> in addition to uh, some interesting things uh, that, that my group does. So I have taken, I decided to take a bit of a historical perspective. I'll sample, sample a few things that we've done over the years and really share to you conceptually how we uh, approach our research and, and what do we do with our, our research. I guess it all started when, uh, you know, after being a, a, a bachelor's uh, student then a PhD student at British Columbia, when I was a, a postdoc at Columbia University, uh, I, I definitely knew that I really enjoy learning about chemical reactivity, about how reactions do happen, and about what we call the structural activity relations, how a particular composition of atoms and their arrangement in space determine physical, chemical, or biological properties. Uh, so I decided, well, this, is, this, this should be a good job to have to, to think about these things uh, for a living. But I thought, you know, it, it needs to be a sl slightly different. So I became intrigued, partly because of my, post -doc my uh, doctoral work about reactions in crystals. So I began, be, began, be, became intrigued about chemical reactions, chemical processes that actually would occur in crystalline solids. So crystalline solids are, of course, beautiful. And one of the things about crystalline solids that probably you haven't think about is that when you hold a crystal, as you move that crystal in, in, in any direction in space, you know what orientations the molecules do have in that crystal. If you use a, a field, you know exactly what part of the molecule is interacting with that field. So you, you have a level of understanding and precision that is unusual, and you can get a precise atomic uh, description by doing either X-ray crystallography or today uh, electron diffraction. I submitted a bunch of applications, and uh, the faculty here at UCLA decided that there might have been some merit in, in the ideas that I was proposing. Maybe this guy is not so crazy about looking at reactions in crystals, right? Not to mention that they're very, very beautiful. Since then, we learned how to do many experiments and chemistry with what we call nanocrystals. And I mentioned that because that was sort of in the invitation. So we can make crystals that are you know, a fraction of a micron, as little as about 100 nanometers. And we suspend it in, say, water. And they scatter light like that. So this is actually a nanocrystal in suspension. But we also think of crystals as microscopic specimens of that sort, OK? So I came to UCLA in, in 1992, and um, I, I came to join one of the most distinguished groups of physical organic chemists in the world. Professor Don Cram had won the Nobel Prize six years early. Uh, Ken Haug was uh, department chair. In fact, he, he was the department chair who hired me. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> in the ranks, we had Orval Chapman, Chris Foote, Frank Canet, Mike Young, and Francois Diederich all of whom were really doing uh, groundbreak work in, in, in the chemical sciences, in particularly reaction mechanisms and, and uh, designing new reactions and things of that sort. So th this was an exceptional group. The, the new faculty at the time, including Professor Robert Armstrong, Craig Merlick, uh, David Miles, uh, Eve, Eve Rubin, and myself. Uh, Rob and David decided to go on to industry. The rest of us are stuck here, and we're still here. Of course, you cannot do anything in academia without uh, talented students. The first students who joined my group are Steve Sheen, Amy Keating, and Shelley McAlpine. What an amazing group, and these other students joined shortly after. So Steve Sheen is now the vice president of uh, intellectual property and a, and, a, and a really successful company in Manhattan. Amy Keating is a professor at MIT, and Shelley McAlpine started as a professor at San Diego State University, and then she went on to accept a job at the University of New South Wales in, uh, in uh, Australia. Really, really talented people. And my group is sort of sitting here, today sitting here in the front, so you know, I'm really happy that I get to interact with a lot of really talented uh, people. 
And of course, the question that you will probably have in mind, everybody will have is, well, why crystals, right? So we learn about chemistry in the gas phase and in solution, we learn a lot of things. So, so why crystals? Well, because something amazing happens during crystallization. I decided to put it in context. In, if you think of an aspirin tablet, it contains uh, acetyl salicylic acid shown here, right? There is enough molecules in an aspirin tablet to put one molecule in every cell of every human being in the planet, right? So think about molecular machines. That, that would be an incredible accomplishment, right? And molecules in solution, this is the, there's some aspirin here probably, maybe not aspirin, but let's assume it is. Uh, you know, molecules are not unlike people, right? They're chaotic. <laughs> some move fast, some move slow, some are bumping into each other, some are fighting, you know. Uh, they, they're doing all kinds of things. So molecules are minding their own business in solution. But something magic happens at the moment of crystallization. And we see what happens that imagine the entire population of the globe coming together, aligning themselves, forming kind of bonds within each other, staying put, and really coming together to look all essentially the same. So we have something truly amazing. There is a reduction of entropy, or there is an increase in order that you couldn't get in any other way in, a, in that scale. So we can get, you know, not, not only uh, enough molecules to put one in, every cell of every human in the planet, but even many, many more, right? And what we get is uh, we can now get the crystal structure, and you can see that the aspirin molecules look exactly the same. There is order, there is rigidity, and there is proximity. So these are the attributes that we will be exploring in our research and in our work. Order means homogeneity. They're all the same. Every single molecule in, within the, the, any crystalline specimen, or even in this tablet, is the same as every other molecule. Right, so there, there is a reduction in terms of the, the, the information content that is pretty significant. Rigidity leads to restricted reactivity, sometimes to no reactivity at all. And proximity leads to mechanical electronic coupling between those molecules. So this is just an image that illustrates the sort of thing that we propose to do, you know, and that we, we've been doing ever since. We, select molecules that have uh, in, in certain properties, have in, some encoded reactivity that we know about. And uh, if we know something about how crystals form and what people call crystal engineering, we can encode reactivity in the molecule and in the crystal. So reactivity is encoded both in the molecular and in the crystal structure. And these molecules are perfectly, perfectly stable, but we're gonna use light as a reagent. So light is going to activate this molecule. So that they will have enough energy to form the bonds that you see here. So two molecules adjacent to each other, they pack beautifully in pairs. You highlight here that there is two molecules that will, with the absorption of light, will form a four-membered ring, a little square there, and that happens with every molecule in that crystal specimen. So this is very special. The rigidity, homogeneity, and proximity allow for this reaction to take place with an incredible amount of chemical control. This is the, the sort of chemical control that you only see in biological systems, such as enzymes. <clears throat> so I thought, you know, let, let me remind you some, some of the general chemistry. I said I was going to do that. So let us talk a little bit about entropy. Entropy, most of us think, well, entropy is about order, but there's a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. And information content. And this sort of put together in, in some way, conceptually, how we look at our research. So let us start with entropy. The first form of entropy that chemists look at is called thermodynamic <coughs> entropy, was proposed by Clausius. And thermodynamic entropy is defined as the total amount of heat or enthalpy that is contained in a substance at a given temperature or divided by the temperature where it was measured. And if we use a specific uh, uh, <coughs> value, parameters like a certain temperature, a certain amount of mass, and, uh, and we can distinguish different molecules by measuring the entropy. In fact, we can dist distinguish different forms of the same element, right? So these are two allotropes of carbon. We have diamond and we have C60. And if you look here, 
but you can quickly distinguish that. You can tell that, in fact, uh, the, uh, C60 or Buckminster Fullerin, which has the shape of a, of a football uh, or a soccer ball, has about, <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to remember that, right? <laughs> this is not a, a football here. Uh, has about three times as much entropy as diamond, right? So that, that's some, some, of some value. And the thing that we may remember also is that we can also distinguish between states of matter. So solids, uh, we have here a carbon in the gas phase, and which is something very special, right? That in the gas phase, the, the entropy is a lot bigger. And the one conclusion that can be drawn so far and people will draw is, of course, that added heat induces molecular motion and or you can break chemical bonds. So we use that energy to move molecules around or we use that energy sometimes to break bonds, sometimes weak bonds and sometimes very strong bonds. So that, that's thermodynamic entropy. But there is another. There is also statistical entropy pro proposed by Boltzmann. Now look at the question of the Boltzmann entropy. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so the PI in the Boltzmann equation re refers to the states of your system. So how are the molecules in that particular substance described? Let us go take a step back and make it a little easier, right? So we need to think about that the motion of molecules occurs in the form of changes in shape. We call them conformations. So when a molecule changes the shape, you know, we call those different conformations. You can have vibrational motion. You can have rotational motion where the molecules are rotating. You can have translational motion, they're moving. And if your molecule has magnetic moments in their nuclei, they will have also spin state. So this is where the energy will go. This is, these are the containers of energy because that's how molecules express kinetic energy. That's how the energy is contained the heat will go into that. So imagine that you have your aspirin, uh, let's say you have a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin, an absolute zero. That means that there is no temperature, there is no heat. What that means is that we, we don't have any changes in shape, we don't have any, we have the lowest energy vibrations, there is no rotations, there is no translation, and we, will, we have also no spin state. So everything is at the bottom, and every molecule is identical to every other molecule in this perfect crystal. What that means is that the population fraction is one, a hundred percent. And you might remember that the logarithm of one is zero. That means that the entropy of a perfect crystal is indeed zero. There's no entropy in a perfect crystal, or it's zero. But what we recognize is that if we add heat, we will populate more states. So in the case of the crystal, we go back to our crystal, start heat increasing the temperature. So we will populate, our crystal cannot change shape, cannot rotate, cannot translate, but it can have internal vibrations. The molecules can vibrate. So we populate those states and we can populate spin states also. But it's largely vibrations. Now in the crystal, the bonds vibrate but the molecules also vibrate. So molecules, if, if my two hands are two molecules, they, they can vibrate together in sort of a slow waves. We would, we would call those acoustic phonons. And that's how sound is transmitted to solids, actually. They're acoustic phonons. Or the molecules can go like that, a shorter wavelength, and those are called optical phonons, and those interact with electromagnetic radiation. But that's all we have in crystals, vibration. So we increase the temperature, the entropy of the crystal increases, and, and those vibrations begin to get so wild, right, at some point, that the weak bonds that are kept the mole keep the molecules in the crystal together break. And what happens is a phase transition. Our crystal melts, and now we have a liquid. Now that we have a liquid, then we have to see that now we let all of the states populate. So the population fraction of more states, we have many more here, we can see them here. Now we have changes in shape. We have vibrations. Our molecules now can rotate. Our molecules can translate. They can move. And we can populate spin states. So all of that energy becomes so violent at some point that the molecules decide to leave the liquid. So they will go into the gas phase. So that represents the entropy of the gas phase, right? And so that means that we just keep populating more and more of those states. So 
that's where, that's where the heat goes. And so we need to ask ourselves, so what's available to our molecules or to our crystals to populate those states? So if we go back to our picture here, if you think about it, well, diamond, that's the structure of diamond. One diamond, is, if anybody here is wearing one diamond, you have a single molecule either in your ears or in your, in your finger. <laughs> one diamond is one molecule. I think that's so cool. And all atoms, all carbon atoms are linked together. So the only thing that you can have is vibrations. So if you cannot have a lot of heat, the entropy is going to be, of course, small compared to balls, right? So if you have soccer balls, the soccer balls can rotate. In fact, if there is a soccer ball missing, they can even translate. They can move around. They can vibrate. So you have many, many more states in the soccer balls than you have in diamond. And that is why the entropy of diamond is a lot smaller than the entropy of buckyballs, right? So, and at the same time, this order, there is more order here than there is order there. So there is a connection with order as well. So now that we begin to get, things begin to get really interesting. So let's, let's go back to this image, right? So let's see what we've done, right? So we've seen that the entropy of the gas is more than the entropy of the liquid is more than the entropy of the solid, right? Uh, but this is an important observation also. If you think about it, the population fraction of the states in the gas, in the gas is not the same states that you have in the liquid or in the solid. There are different molecules in different, in different media. So this is a really important thing because Maybe this is not a, a nice way to represent the growth of the changes in, 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 in the entropy of our system. Maybe we can do it like that, right? So there are some, uh, some uh, overlap between some states that occur in all three media, but you know, there are many that only, will only be in the liquid or in the gas, and some that will only exist in, 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 in the solid. So that's really important because that allows us to make a really interesting connection that's not one that we must often learn in, in general chemistry, but there is a connection with communication uh, theory. If you think about information content, which was articulated by Claude Shannon in 1949 by this equation, take a look at this equation and take a look at that equation. The only difference is the Boltzmann, the, the constant, right? Here we have Boltzmann constant. And he will have a different constant that will give us a different value, but it's exactly the same equation. So what are the PI in Shannon's equation? Well, the PI are the probability that you will have a symbol that will be part of a message in a message. So whether you have the letters that will become the words, that will become the sentences, that will become the paragraphs of a particular message. So, if I tell you about my book on green chemistry, the information content of my book, I can tell you, is exactly 6.5 megabytes. <laughs> that is the information content, right? Now, Shannon described communication theory in terms of you have an information source that has an information content. That information can be transmitted through a channel to a receiver. And if I open my book in page, say, 210, it turns out that I can read English. <laughs> so I'm a competent receiver. <laughs> I can tell you that in page 210, chapter 7, emerging greener technologies and alternative energy sources. That's the message. Right. So can you see the difference between information content and message? The information content comes from the message. So the information content is the message that we convert into bits or bytes or megabytes to tell how much information do, you, do we have to put here with regard to what is the message that we have here. It's very similar in chemistry, but we don't recognize it that way. That we have different chemical messages when you are in the gas phase, in the liquid, or in the solid. Different information, different messages, different things that we can exploit. And that is, in, in large way, the way uh, how we formulate our world. 
One of the things that is very, far, very frustrating to many students is uh, chemistry can be very hard because chemistry is really uh, a symbolic and evocative discipline. When, you look at, when I look at a structure like that, I, it, it, evo it evokes a lot of information. I can tell you so much about that structure because I'm trained, because I learn about it. I can tell you the types of reactions that it will have. I, can, I have a pretty good idea what aspirin is going to be soluble in. I can tell you what it's not going to be soluble in. I have a pretty good idea of what sort of a melting point it will have. There's a lot that I can tell that is not explicit because it, it's evocative. And that's something that is really important and interesting. Evocative means that I'm using the information content in my head to decode limited information on the screen. Now, it doesn't have to be the information content in my head. It could be the information content on the web. And that's how machine learning could have a strong impact on a science like chemistry, right? So how do we apply this to chemical problems? Well, the, the very first example, we're talking about the early 1990s, right? So look, this is a publication in 1997, uh, Steve Sheen and Amy Keating. We selected molecules that have an information content. They have a message such that the structure is going to be crystalline. We, we can tell something about that. And we can tell that when this structure takes a photon represented as an H nu, we're going to break bonds. We're going to lose a nitrogen molecule. And we're going to make this carbon atom that instead of, instead of having four bonds, which normally carbon does, has only two bonds. That is very energetic. So the energy content of this particular structure that is called a carbon is a very high energy content. And high energy content at a given temperature means high entropy, right? So we have a system that has a very high entropy. It's messy. We, we exist in the liquid phase, and the number of options, the number of messages that exist in the liquid phase are many. So this structure can decode those messages and give many different products. If you look carefully, these are all different. It, at first sight, looks like the same, but it's actually, they're all different. And it can give other products, and it can react with solvent, and it can react with oxygen. It's just a mess. Right? We have a very low selectivity and low yields because we have a very high statistical entropy. There is a lot of opportunities, a lot of information for that molecule to, to, to react. So what's going to happen if we change the, the state of this molecule? We go from the liquid phase. Let's go. Oh, we're, what we're going to do before doing that, we're, we're going to look at our molecule in a different projection. So what we call in chemistry a Newman projection. And all that you really need to think, to think about is that we're like looking at that molecule from that direction, down that bond. It would look like that, and we simplify it and show it like that. Don't worry, I think. The only thing that really we want to think about is that we're going to be looking at molecules that have different shapes. That's all. We call them conformations. And we remain in the liquid, and we disclose that in the liquid. And if you see, we have different shapes, different conformations. And the arrows mean that they can go back and forth, back and forth, so that, again, you, you have a high information content, a high entropy. Each of those molecules, which we call diazo compounds, can, go, can absorb a photon and lose a nitrogen molecule and give this divalent carbon that is so energetic that I just mentioned. Now, each of these carbons can equilibrate. But once in a while, they will have an opportunity to go on to give a different product. If you look carefully, these are all actually different also. Right? So this is, this is a manifestation of, very, of, of a high entropy and a, a large information content. So what's going to happen then when we go from here to here? So if we transition to the crystal, we reduce the entropy. That's what I mean by a large reduction of entropy. Our crystal, our molecule will select the lowest energy conformation of the lowest energy shape in these beautiful crystals. When we, when we expose these crystals to light, they're going to do the same. Nitrogen is going to be lost. We have our divalent carbon, and that goes on to give one product instead of many different products. That hydrogen atom will move from that position to that position, as also shown here. That's, that's the reaction uh, here. You can also see that 
we can go without we wouldn't do the reaction typically on on, a, on large beautiful crystals we probably would do it more like on a powder or on a suspension but you can see how the nice red crystal is red because of this particular functional group becomes white because the product is colorless and we have a reaction that occurs with very high selectivity and very high chemical yield because we reduce the configurational entropy of our system. That's what crystals can do for us. So, how do, how we, can we take advantage of that? Indeed, over the last uh, 30 years, I suppose, we've engineered reactions in crystals with an eye towards green chemistry. We can do chemistry with no solvents, no metals, no toxic reagents, quantitative, quantitative yields, and require no purification. We can do them in single crystals, in powders, or we can do, it, do them in large scales by using flow system. And we can synthesize molecules of relatively high complexity, as shown here. A nice example that I can highlight now is this. This is a really complex molecule. Psychotriadine is a molecule that represents an effort in a couple of years ago, uh, I guess uh, four years ago already, I can't believe that, between the groups of Professors Neil Gark, Ken Hauck, and my own group. So we've demonstrated that you can use reactions in crystals to really increase the level of complexity in a relatively simple manner, in a way that you might only expect for uh, enzymes and biological systems. So, this is now the late 1990s and we're pushing the envelope, right? We, we wanna see how, how much can we get away with. So, could we encode chemical reactivity in crystals near zero Kelvin? So, what we're trying to do is we're gonna go from a, relative, a, a certain amount of uh, heat and entropy on a crystal, and keep an eye on that. What we're going to do is we're going to lower the temperature. We're going to reduce it even more. We're going to take away the kinetic energy of this molecule. We're going to take our crystals, we're going to find the right molecule, and we're going to have no molecular diffusion, no rotation, no ch changes in shape. We're only have, we're going to have what we call the lowest energy vibrations, or we call them the zero point energy. It turns out that molecules, even at zero Kelvin, the bonds will still vibrate, but they will do it at a frequency that is the lowest frequency that they can have. And, and so those are the zero point energy vibrations. So this is the challenge. We need to come up with a structure that is going to react in the solid state, even at zero Kelvin, because the reaction is encoded within the information content of our molecule, and it's gonna be within the vibrations of the molecule. Nothing more than vibrations. So we select, oh, and the nice thing is that, is, does that have any use? I don't know, right? But you know, if you wanted to do chemistry in the space station, the temperature in outer space is about 2.7 Kelvin. So there might be use for that, right? So we're there, and, uh, oh, Oh, here. So the structure that we selected to analyze this is a structure where we, it's a molecule where a hydrogen atom is going to be transferred from a carbon to an oxygen in the excited state. So we always need a photon to get it going. So this is going to be the reactant and that's going to be the product. And then the electrons are going to reorganize to give that. That's going to be actually the final product. But we're going to look at this step when the hydrogen moves from carbon to oxygen. So typically, we, we represent reactions like this. There is a reaction, there is a product, and there is a barrier that needs to be overcome thermally. So thermal energy needs to be put to go over the barrier and go onto the product. Our experiment is gonna, is gonna be, we're gonna start at some temperature, and then we're gonna lower the temperature. So that we, we're gonna take away the thermal energy and make the reaction less and less likely. Right? So provide thermal energy. Now, we cannot go to the, the space station, of course, but we have a little, you know, R2D2 here. So this is a liquid helium refrigerator that we have in my group, and we can go to 4 Kelvin with that little device. And the way we do the experiment is, uh, the way chemists like to do this is by, by measuring the reaction rate, increasing reaction rate, and the inverse temperature. What that means is that we're gonna start at some higher temperature, and then we're gonna go to colder and super cold temperature, okay? And we're gonna measure the rate of reaction. So our data is gonna look something like that. We're gonna start at some hot temperature and it's gonna be fast. We're gonna reduce the temperature and then it's gonna be slow. Reduce the temperature a little bit more and it's gonna get slower. This is called an Arrhenius equation in case you're interested. 
And we know that we're doing well because we, we, if we fit those, we find a straight line that is according to you what you would expect from theory. And you would say, well, if I go to even lower temperature, I should get even a slower reaction. Now, if our hypothesis is correct, that means that maybe we can overcome this barrier and do something different. So we do the measurement, and we find, yes, actually, there is a deviation from there. And then we do many more measurements, and we can observe something like that. We get to the point where the rate of reaction doesn't depend on temperature. So, uh, you know, the rate of reaction is constant, even though we're going to very low temperatures. So this is what chemists call tunneling, because we no longer need to go over the body. We, 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 we talk about having a quantum mechanical tunneling reaction, right? So no, we don't no, no longer have thermal energy. We can just go through the, through the, through the barrier. Now, you, you may be thinking, well, can you really go through the barrier? Well, I, I already told you the answer, right? We're looking for vibrations. Now, the beauty about chemistry, of course, is that everything is quantized. It's quantum mechanics. And it turns out that the location of that hydrogen relative to the carbon and the hydrogen cannot be limited to what we call the classical potential. In fact, if we square the wave function, we get the probability of where the hydrogen is going to be found. And if you see the probability of finding that hydrogen extends beyond the classical potential. So what it means is that within the vibration of this atom, there is an opportunity to actually vibrate way beyond than what we suppose was going to vibrate. And that's what quantum mechanical tunneling is. Now, if, if, you, if you're curious about the real data, that's the actual real data. So we have measurements between 100 Kelvin and down to about 12 or 13 Kelvin here. And you can see we reach this regime of quantum mechanical tunneling, where the only thing that the molecule have is this vibration, and then the, the hydrogen can transfer. How do we know that this is correct? Well, you always need a control experiment, right, guys? <laughs> so the control experiment is simple. Change the structure. Instead of having a six-member ring, have a seven-member ring. That screws up everything about the reaction. All of a sudden, the, barrier, the width of the barrier is so large that the wave function does not permeate through the barrier enough, and we stop quantum mechanical tunneling. So we can fine-tune quantum mechanical tunneling and that's kind of cool, right? Because, you know, that means that if ever it is needed, we can have a chemical reaction that is virtually unchanged, whether you do it in Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or even Pluto, or in outer space. So that might be important at some point. So can we push the envelope again? So, you know, we are able to decode structures where the chemistry can occur even at zero Kelvin in principle. Right? We, no one has ever been at zero Kelvin. Close, but not quite. So if you're pushing the envelope now, what direction would you take? I mean, right, we're going as cold as we can. So now we're thinking, could we design crystal, could we crystal engineer a structurally encoded motion? Could we have a crystal where the molecules inside are moving as fast as they would move in the gas phase or in the liquid. Can we design crystals with lattice forming static elements, a little like a chassis linked to moving parts? Like a machine, right? I mean, that's probably too ambitious. <laughs> but the point is, right, that we know that macroscopically, at least, you can make systems where you can have a high density, high occupation, uh, you know, periodic motion, and, uh, and it, it is compatible still. So that became sort of our pushing the envelope in a different direction. So it's kind of fun to think about that. So how do we represent that in this little cartoon? I don't know if you agree, but I thought we could do that. <laughs> right. So we're, we're going into phases that belong typically in the gas phase or in the liquid or in both but that were not normally thought possible in a crystalline solid. Can we do that? So our target is going to be, can, can, what do we know about condensed phase matter with one component with high order and high internal motion? So the, when we started thinking about this, we, we went about it 
in this way. What can we learn from nature? So I said, okay, let, let us figure it out. So let us find an increase in molecular motion and an increase in order, and what do we know about that? And so we decided, well, we do know that crystals of molecules with arbitrary shape have a lot of order, as much order as we can have, but they, they really have no motion. And we also think, well, it, it, when you really want motion, you probably think about a liquid, right? No order, but a lot of motion. Now, there is a, n a number of condensed phase structures that are called mesophases. I'm just going to illustrate one. Liquid crystals. So liquid crystals increase the motion of the molecule, but there is a sharp reduction in order. Right? What else does nature provide us with? Glasses. Right? Where you've cooled a liquid and you don't have neither order nor motion. And clearly, probably you're already seeing here, right, that there is something interesting. That nature increases motion at the expense of order. But, you know, can we beat nature? Can we design a structurally encoded molecular motion and a structurally encoded molecular order by design? Can we engineer it, right? And that's the power of, of chemistry, that we know how to manipulate structures and atoms and molecules in ways that fulfill a specific function. So can we make crystals again that are just like every other crystal, right? But the molecules inside have fantastic rotation, like they were in the gas phase or in solution. That, that's the challenge. And we decided to call amphidynamic crystals. Amphi, of course, meaning both, like um, ambidextrous or others. Amphidynamic means both sides of the dynamic spectrum, static elements and moving elements. And we thought, well, amphidynamic crystals would really be an interesting platform for, for crystal and molecular machines. So we pursued that and said, okay, what sort of structures do we need? We need structurally encoded motion. And it didn't take too long, in fact, for, to think about, you know, this is the actual compass that you see pictured there. And I was looking at it today. Some of you can see it became so yellow. <laughs> it's, been, it's been like, I guess, it's been like 30 years or something like No, maybe 20 years, right? So it became totally yellow. And of course, I have a little gyroscope here. And the one thing about my gyroscope is I can put it in a state of motion and I can put it in the box and the motion will continue in the box. So the structure is encoded in such a way that there is a static element and there is a moving element, right? And of course, you see here that we, we can have indeed molecular representations that mimic the topology of these two objects. So we can design molecular compasses and molecular gyroscopes because basically they have the same cross section. There is a frame, there is an axle that links to the frame, and there is, in this case, uh, a magnetic dipole or a magnetic needle. In this case, there is a, a, a mass that rotates and carries angular momentum. Well, we, we decided to start with that by putting elements like, such as fluorine with, that create an electric dipole so that this is the analogous of that in terms of function. And it's a little bit of the analogous of that in terms of shape. And you can see a, a very crude uh, manifestation of how the, what a molecule looks like. This is misleading, right? Because in this, in this model, I'm just activating one rotation, one degree of freedom. But that molecule, in reality, every single bond is vibrating. So this is not accurate. But this is just an illustration of what we can do. So that will be a structurally encoded motion. Uh, so, how about a structurally encoded order, right? We would expect that a molecule like this would have a certain affinity to bring, come together with other molecules and form crystals that I'm, I'm representing here. And when you begin to do that, then you begin to, dis to discover some interesting things that are totally worth exploring. If you see here in my little model, uh, the rotation of one molecule affects the rotation of the next and the next. This is very primitive, but nonetheless, it's something that could occur. And we can see that we, if we take a model like a group of uh, compasses, as shown here. 
So what we have here is that I have a, a, a little group of compasses. Maybe I can even pass. This is a magnet, and you can play with the magnet and pass it around. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did like 20 years ago, right? We, that adds also like 20 years old. And this is basically what we see. We, we find something that is referred to as emergent behavior of emergent properties. And that can be quickly manifested here. If you notice, this compass is isolated and is pointing to the north. Now, these compasses are not isolated. Here we have a 1D chain, and he want a two-dimensional hexagonal structure. And look at that. Not only are they ignoring the, the Earth's north, but they have their own macroscopic polarization. They come together, and they begin to display properties that are the properties of the ensemble, not the properties of the individual which is what we call emergent properties. All right, so the question began, began, uh, became, are there general solutions for amphidynamic crystals? And we came up with three solutions, and I think this is pretty comprehensive. The first solution is what we call free volume motion. That is, create structure where there's, there's enough free volume that the displacement of your object would be would fit within that model, right? Now, in this case, I have a pendular displacement. We've really focused a lot of our attention in rotational motion. So this is a structure. It's called meta, a metal organic framework. And in fact, what you see here is uh, it's, it's an X-ray structure where the hydrogen really not, doesn't know where to stay and it is because it's rotating too fast. If you got, when I got a better idea of what that might look like, we have a beautiful molecular dynamic simulation prepared for, by Gene Grant, uh, who's a joint student with Ken Howe. And that's what it looks like. Now, the interesting thing about it is that the time scale that we're looking at here is in the trillions of seconds. It's 10 to the 12th per second. And what you see here is that this is what we call a molecular rotor. And this sometimes rotates as fast as it would rotate in the gas phase. But it's chaotic. Is Brownian. So it can go either way. But this is something that was never accomplished. This is the first time that anybody designed a crystal where there is motion that is so fast by design that the motion reaches the domain of motion in the gas phase. Although it's not quite gas phase, it's more like a liquid because it's coupled with the framework. And that provides enough of a chaotic uh, dynamics. So that's one solution, free volume. What other solutions might you have? Volume conserving motion. So if you have an object that doesn't change in shape as it rotates, then you can have that. And this is an example of that. So this is a very globular molecule. And it really doesn't matter where the molecule is. It's volume conserving. So there is fast motion all the time, basically. And that's another solution. The third solution is the most complex one. It's what we call correlated motions or gearing. Again, trying to push the envelope towards machinery, right? So you can see here that the rotation of one of these groups needs to be coupled with the rotation of the other. There is just not enough room for them to be independent. So they have to be correlated. So we've been working towards the synthesis of molecules like this. We've successfully made some of these molecules, but they have not been active in the crystal. It's making them active in the crystal is not particularly easy. But sometimes you'd be rather be lucky, right, than, than be good. And, so, and that's what happened. So we came up with a structure that can be represented like that. I elaborate that more now. It's a structure that is made, actually, with two steroid molecules. So this is uh, mestranol. It's actually uh, the, the drug that really changed the world because this was the first, the first anticonceptive that was produced uh, massively in the, I guess, 1960s. We decided to take two of those and link it to one rotor, in this case, something here in the middle. By law, we get a structure that looks like that, like nested rotors. And you can see there is one rotor here, one rotor there, another there. And there is not enough room for them to rotate independently. And what they do is they switch back and forth in a correlated motion like that, about 1.5 million times per second. And this is the first example of when you can have correlated motion in a crystalline solid. So we're very excited about that. Now, you might be wondering, well, and how do you measure 
motion and rotation in the solid state. Well, we're lucky to be at UCLA, right? UCLA, thanks to many of you and what you do for us, is a fairly resourceful uh, institution and we have equipment that allows us to do such experiments. So in this case, we use uh, nuclear magnetic resonance in the solid state. We take our crystals, we make them, bring them into a powder, we put them into these uh, uh, rotors. Sometimes we, rot we put them to rotate inside the magnet, sometimes we don't. And the type of data that we, we get looks like that. In this case, we, we have to label these this atoms. So the atoms that we want to probe, we need to change hydrogen for heavy hydrogen or deuterium. So we use deuterium and use deuterium NMR. And depending on the type of motion, we get a different spectrum. So if there is a little oscillation or a slow motion, it looks like that. If there is a, a jumping motion, the spectrum evolves into something like that. And if we have continuous motion, it goes into something like that. So we have very precise way to detecting these motions in the solid state. We've looked at a number of molecules uh, on different structures. And I want to quickly tell you that very recently, well, two years ago, three years ago, we, we in collaboration with Stuart Brown in the Department of Physics, we, we were able to, for the first time, make a structure that has the properties of this particular object. We have a structure, it's a metal organic framework based on zinc that has these groups marked in yellow that carry an electric dipole because of those two fluorines. The crystal structure shows the fluorine distributed around because it's always rotating. However, when we go, when we, the experiment that uh, the group of Stuart did is they measure the capacitance of our crystal, so put the crystals between two capacitors and then change the polarity plus minus plus minus at some frequency and we will look at the response of the capacitance so when you have a capacitance means that inside the sample there is a response to the electric field you can store energy because the, the molecules are moving with the field in some way so what you see in this experiment is, is uh, we start at 275 kelvin we cool it down and the capacitance increases that just means that the dipoles become more aligned with the field because the energy difference becomes a little smaller. But something interesting happens at 100 Kelvin. What happens is illustrated in this little movie. So as we get getting closer and closer to 100 Kelvin, we have the spontaneous organization of all of the dipoles. They become organizing what is called an icing symmetry or an icing lattice, where all of a sudden, there is no polarization, so in fact the capacitance should have dropped to zero, but it didn't because there is a still part of the molecule that can oscillate back and forth a little. So that, that gives us this little regime where there is a decrease until finally we reach about 50 Kelvin and then it goes precipitously down. So again, this is the first example where you have a crystal with internal dipoles where there is communication with the molecules to reach spontaneous order. There's a lot of interesting opportunities in material sciences for that. So this is a, a, a class of molecules that will be called multiferroic and electro-optic crystals because they will allow us to control many of the properties of an external field and the properties of light and one with the other. The last bit that I'm going to show you very, very quickly is uh, rigidity, homogeneity, and proximity, right? So those are the three things. So one of the things that happens when light comes into our crystals where the molecules are not coupled very strongly is that the light becomes an exciton. That means that the excitation moves around by a hopping mechanism. So that means uh, that there is an electron that moves, but it's followed by the hole. They're, they go together. The excitation moves and hops from crystal to crystal to crystal. And it depends on the lifetime of the, of the excited state, but it, the molecules jump about one billionth per second. Every picosecond it moves around. So if you follow the trajectory, it might have looked like that. So if you wait a few hundred picoseconds, you may have a lot of molecules <coughs> covered. So the question became, could we possibly take a photon, see an exciton, and have every one of those molecules become a product? 
So one photon, many products, by taking advantage of the coupling that exists in the solid. It's, it seems unreasonable. You think, well, where, where are you getting the energy? And that's exactly the case. Where do you get the energy? So what are we talking about here? About molecular information and information content that we can decode. So it is known that there are molecules that undergo what is called an adiabatic reaction. This is pretty sophisticated chemistry. So you, you, you can brag to your friends that you know about adiabatic reactions. <laughs> an adiabatic reaction is one where you start with a stable molecule, with a photon goes into an excited state, and then the reaction happens in the excited state. The excited state reactant becomes the excited state product. So you still have the you, you have the product and you have the energy. Isn't that cool? You've already did the reaction, but you have the energy. What that means is, of course, that if you're in a crystal, there is a molecule right next that an exciton will allow you to again and again and again, so that you have an opportunity to set up a chain reaction, something that is called a quantum chain because we, you are using one quantum of light to generate a process where you're getting many, many chemical reactions. So this, this is something that, again, was never done before. Uh, we've, we have a few examples. The most recent example that I will share with you today, is a it hasn't been published, so you, you get to actually hear about some unpublished results from Dr. Indrajit Paul sitting in the audience. Well, we decided that they, uh, we, 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 we selected a molecule that is called a dual benzene, shown here, and a molecule that is benzene or Huckel benzene. So our, our reaction is going to be a dual benzene going into a Huckel benzene. But we need an antenna because we need to set up the, the spin of the electrons. So we need an antenna. And then, you know, we will see a quantum chain the way I showed it. So the, the experiments that Indrajit decided to do involve the use of mixed crystals, where we are going to include the antenna as an impurity. So we're going to dub the crystal with a tiny bit of an impurity, maybe 0.1%, maybe 10%. Indrajit's design involves an ionic substrate, taking advantage of basically a salt, where this is going to be what we call the crystal engineering auxiliary. This is what is going to help us make the crystal. And we can put an antenna there. So this is the substrate and that's the antenna. And we can show the structure of the substrate and the structure of the antenna. You can see here they're wearing exactly the same sweater. <laughs> so they can fit in the same crystal with no problem. And the results are pretty spectacular. You can see that here. We can demo I want to show you some of the experiments that my students do. So we use lasers to prove the, the, what happens. So we use here a laser to, to detect the spectrum of the product in this case. So we start with the product. This is the so-called Huckel benzene. And we detect the triplet excited state of Huckel benzene here. And that's the spectrum. And we measure it least for about 98 nanoseconds. So it's very short lived. Now, if instead of starting with the product, we start with the reactant. And if the reaction is adiabatic, we should see the same, right? look at that. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> this, you get the same spectrum whether you start with the product or indeed with the reactant, meaning that the reactant adiabatically becomes the product and the excited state of the product. So with all of that, Indrajit goes to the lab, measures how many reactions can we get per photon, and this is his data, right? So he can put between 0.1% all the way to 10% of the antenna. And he noticed that he can get as many as 517 reactions per photon in 100 nanoseconds. What th this is, again, another truly spectacular result. That is something that, uh, you know. So this, this provides a potential mechanism to, to amplify a chemical signal. And we think that we're not done. We think that we can improve the 500. Uh, into millions. In fact, we have some really cool data where using electrons, we can go into the millions of products per, per electron. Well, I've been talking about molecular machines, so I want to be mindful, of course, that we have a lot of, to, to celebrate at UCLA. 
because one of our colleagues, Fraser Stoddard, uh, did much, much of his seminal work on molecular machinery here at UCLA, and he was here in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016, along with professors Ben Feringa and Jean-Pierre Sauvage for Chemistry Illustrated here that we don't really have time to celebrate today. But one thing that I think is pretty cool is that both uh, Stoddard and Feringa remain active, and guess what? They put the molecular machines in crystals. Isn't that cool? I thought that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of finish with what I think is the most spectacular, most beautiful molecular machines that was actually designed by nature, but its function was elucidated by one of our faculty, Professor Paul Boyer, who also won the Nobel Prize in 1997 for elucidating the mechanism of uh, ATP synthase. Look at that. Isn't that a spectacular? <coughs> and, uh, you know, uh, Paul Boyer elucidated the mechanism of this beautiful molecular machine through classic enzymology. It's just amazing. And so this is the challenge. This is what at some point, at some day, maybe we will be able to do. Right? So this is not a crystal, but certainly there is a reduction of entropy that is pretty significant. And if we learn how to really use entropy, I think there is a lot that we can do. I started with this image because crystals are not only gorgeous, right? They're beautiful. They give us a lot of structural information, but they have a lot of function. If we bring the function in the molecules, the crystal give us the reduction of entropy that, that let us do things that are pretty impressive. I talked to you about taming highly reactive intermediates, reactions near zero Kelvin by quantum mechanical tunneling. I talked about engineered molecular dynamics. I talked about the emergent behavior of rotary dipolar arrays and photon amplification with a gain or quantum chains. It's a lot more than needs to be done. So we're really just beginning. Now you understand why instead of, uh, in addition to being the Dean of Physical Sciences, I cannot give this up. This is just <laughs> way too much fun. And I want to finish with, uh, you know, some of you know about this, but I think this is something truly spectacular. This is really going to transform a lot of what we do in, in physical sciences and what we do at UCLA. The UCLA Research Park, Park, the UCLA Quantum Innovation Hub, and the California Institute for Immunology, I mean immunotherapy. Let's see. So what I have here is the clip. This is a great honor to share some, I think, truly uh, incredible and momentous news. UCLA has acquired the Westside Pavilion Mall. Will completely transform this empty former mall into a UCLA research park. It will mean the rebirth of a once bustling mall and will solidify our city's position as the epicenter for scientific achievements. And the importance, frankly, the imperative of doing it here in partnership with UCLA. There was a lot of conversation about where does this belong and who is the best partner. But it was essential that Southern California be the beneficiary. The development of the research park will have monumental impact on UCLA and our city, California, and the world. The opening of the UCLA Research Park will also help the University of California continue to attract the world's best researchers and students in immunology, immunotherapy, and quantum science. We are proud of our past, but we are enlivened about our future. And that future is quite literally being advanced here. So Governor, Governor Newsom came to basically this event very excited about immunology and immunotherapy. And he began to hear about quantum. And he loved talking about quantum and only quantum. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. So UCLA, number one public university. I think uh, I want to recognize that uh, uh, we've been very, very lucky that many of our alumni, uh, many of our supporters, many friends of UCLA have made this possible. This space is an example of that, right? That this is a space that the state of California would have never paid for. It was through the contributions of our alumni, our supporters. And so we're really grateful to all of you, for, for, for all of you that, for believing in our mission, for believing in what we do. We, I think we, we attract a lot of really talented students and the, 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 their science is just spectacular. 
So I need to acknowledge uh, the, the, the students, in, these are graduate students currently in my group, except for Coco, Yuan, and Varun, who are undergraduates. Uh, I'm very uh, lucky to have three incredibly talented postdocs. Uh, the people in yellow <coughs> represent former graduate students, former postdocs. I have a lot of collaborators. Uh, so, you know, again, we, we are an extraordinary institution that attracts a lot of talent. I have to thank the National Science Foundation. I have to thank you for the National Science Foundation. Your taxes, right, have made possible my research for 30 years. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. I can't believe it. I've also had, of course, over the years, funding from the American Chemical Society, the Department of Energy, ARPA-E, UC Mexico, and others. Many of our students come with their own fellowships. Like Christo, for example, he's, uh, he comes from a fellowship from, uh, from Poland, his home country. And so he brings not only his talent, but the resources to do research here at UCLA, because he has an opportunity to do here things that we couldn't do, he couldn't do in other places. So I want to thank all of you for, for, for this uh, really amazing opportunity to share with you my, my research. I want to thank my students for, for, all, for all their hard work. And uh, thank you. <laughs>To reach the, the realm of a few molecules or molecular machines per se, that's going to be very challenging. Thank yeah, thank you. Rich? Yeah, I was going to ask you if you think there is any uh, possibility of using these molecular machines for computing purposes. I think that is a, a, an excellent question, right? So if, if there is a certain control on the local structure of your molecule and, and your molecule carries, carries uh, quantum information, qubits of some form, whether optical or you know, through magnetic uh, um, elements, it's possible. Uh, I am part of a team here at UCLA that is looking at what we call uh, functional qubits, or where we're trying to bring chemistry and the function of chemistry to modulate the, the properties of, of qubits. So I think there could be opportunities, but we, we have to probably think uh, in a, in, a, in a slightly different regime, a different context. The, 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 the real challenge when you think about molecular machines is how do you interface it with a human operator? You know, how do you control it? Yes, please. Yes, you talk about reducing entropy. Yeah. And locally reduced entropy requires energy in the trash can. You talked about the, uh, the energy in the photons. Yes. Tell me where the rest of the entropy uh, so in, in solids, uh, the, the energy of the photon may or may not cause a chemical change, but there is always an excess of energy. Now, energy in crystals is dissipated at, at a very fast uh, pace, so there is a, it's dissipated through molecular vibrations. So in a photon, it, it goes away as photons. It, it can dissipate it through the structure very rapidly. However, you know, so it, again, it depends on the amount of energy you're talking about. So if you use enough energy, you can use the energy of light to even to ablate a solid, right? You can completely obliterate it, or you can even, even melt it if you use the right conditions. So we, one needs to be careful about, you know, the, the amount of energy deposited in, in the sample. Yes? So in terms of the molecular Uh, I think that is a really good question. 
Yeah. There is an area of molecular machinery that, that I think is, is advancing very rapidly, and this is illustrated by the work of Professor Stoddard and, and others. You might want to know that we have a distinguished lecture coming in about a week by Professor David Lee uh, from the UK, I can't remember where he is at right now, but, uh, but he, 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 he brings uh, conceptual aspects of machinery into molecules. Uh, so that field is moving. But I, I, I think, uh, to answer your question, I think, the, again, the, the breakthroughs, the applications we are more likely to come in the area of uh, smart materials. So materials that will have the properties that will let you do some... Uh, so what is a machine, first of all, right? So machine, according to the dictionary, is, uh, is something that uh, transmits forces, motion, energy, or information from one side to another. So the transmission of information is probably one that could be thought about. So <coughs> sensors, for example, that, that can be uh, manipulated through mechanical motions. We have, in fact, a lot of really beautiful work in our department by my colleague Jeff Singh, who's actually sitting here, who developed molecular machines with, with applications in sensing. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think there's already a lot out there, but we just really need to as a community come together and say, so what are we going to recognize to be a, a bona fide molecular machine? Yes, uh, AJ. Um, first, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, second, you seemed really excited earlier about ATP synthase. Um, so I was curious if you know of any other, or if you can share of any other chemical, biological applications of molecular machines that you find really exciting right now. Mm. <clears throat> Well, you know, so the, 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 I think there is a, a number of uh, uh, directions that people are exploring. In fact, um, you know, for instance, the, the use of, uh, of uh, nanoparticles that are magnetic, that you can move them with external magnetic fields, bring them to a particular environment and have a function there. I think there is a lot of exploration. I really don't know about, you know, particular applications that, that I would call really satisfying, but I think there is a lot of progress. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So very impressed by, by your first part you know, of your presentation. And it reminds me of the following that, you know, life formed around 4 billion years ago, almost right. as the planet formed. So there are some theories, ideas, that if we didn't have time to form these complex molecules on Earth, it was from in space where everything is very cold. Right. And, and what you were alluding to, I'm not sure whether you really did that, uh, that, you know, these enzymes and all that, there is a low, uh, low entropy, extremely complex machines. Yes. What you're saying, is, is, it, is it possible that this cold chemistry that, that you have mentioned that happens in space is, is forming this whole thing in the interstellar medium or somewhere in space, these complex right. machines or evolution? I think there's so many there's so many questions that we need to answer, right? <clears throat> questions that we need to ask and we need to answer. But I think you know what's happening in space. You know what what's happening in, in different environments. Um, I think there's a, lo a lot of really interesting questions. The field of what people call astrochemistry is being developed uh, rapidly now. So you know what molecules do exist in interstellar space? What molecules do exist in uh, interstellar dust? In you know in different types of objects. Um, I, I'm, I'm very excited to learn, I was very excited to learn that uh, uh, Titan, I think it is, is, a, is basically a hydrocarbon ball. So the geology of Titan is what, what I do. I look at phase transitions of hydrocarbons. Uh, so I would be a competent geologist in Titan. <laughs> right? So, so many interesting questions, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Then there was a graph. I think it was, my understanding was the least percentage was the most effective to use Right. <coughs> why is that? That's a great question. In fact, one of the reasons why proceeded through this approach to reduce the amount of the antenna is because uh, excitons in crystals sometimes can find each other and annihilate. 
So the, when you have a, a, a large concentration of antennas, instead of helping, they destroy the, the, the excitation. Uh, and so in this particular case, the, the doping was at, at levels that is not catastrophic yet. Uh, but, but we see that the, the decline in the number of molecules per photon is an indication that there is a mechanism that degrades the excitation, presumably because it's correlated with the increase of the antenna, that there is some annihilation of those photons. Yes. The, yeah. Um, so, so we, we, in this case, we, we, we can be limited by the phase diagram of the two component system. So, in, in this case, Indrajit demonstrated that we cannot put more than 10%. And so far, it appears that when we try to put less than 0.1%, we also are not successful. It rejects, when the, the, rejects the, the, the antenna when there is too little antenna. So we're, we're limited, again, by, by nature in some ways. But we have other ideas on, on you know, how to increase the, the number of reactions per photon. Yes, please. Hi, I'm a, a little unfamiliar with molecular machines, but I was wondering if there's any particular properties in molecules <coughs> that means they could potentially have more like, functionality than like, traditional large-scale machines can. Uh, <coughs> That's a really interesting question. So I, I think the, the, primar the, the primary attractive for going into molecular machines is miniaturization. I didn't even talk about it, right? But a lot of what we think about in terms of molecular machines comes from the work of, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, help me out, at Caltech. Uh, Feynman. Uh, yes, Feynman, Richard Feynman. So Richard Feynman, uh, in 1960, gave a beautiful lecture about, he, he speculated about making things smaller and smaller, mi miniaturizing. And I think, so I think the primary uh, appeal is what I mentioned, right, that one millimole, right, which in terms of aspirin is about 200 milligrams of aspirin, is almost enough to put one molecule in every cell of every human being. So the, the, the number of mole mach molecular machines that you could make or, you know, you, you could put molecular machines in a little container that could, in principle, fun function in, in many different ways everywhere. So I think that's the, the primary appeal. On the other hand, you know, there, there is uh, uh, molecules follow the rules of statistical mechanics, meaning that everything is statistical, nothing is fully deterministic. So that means that, that, that there is another set of challenges that we need to work on. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities for chemists. Yes, Max? So it seems to me that one of your constraints was uh, volume conservation as well as free space. Uh, but there's also, it seems to me, a concept of symmetry that comes in that plays fairly heavy in some of the things you design. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the interplay, maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah. That is a really, really interesting question. Again, there, there is a, a, an immediate connection between symmetry and entropy because, uh, again, symmetry determines the, 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 the number of states, whether they're degenerate or not degenerate, and so on, right? So, uh, but uh, a, a very, the, there are simple manifestations in terms of uh, um, in, in materials properties. Where we, where we have materials that, that do, not, do not have uh, mirror symmetry or center of symmetry, then everything is, becomes really interesting because now everything is, uh, is uh, vectorial. When light comes in, it interacts in only one way. You know, so ev everything becomes a lot more interesting. So uh, low symmetry is, uh, is, is a holy grail in many materials, you know, nonlinear optical materials and so on. But there is another really interesting one. In fact, I, I, I didn't tell you, but what really got me into the solid state, my, my dissertation, I, I, I came up with the idea of using crystals of achiral molecules that I knew they were crystallizing chiral space groups. And 
upon reaction, they would give only one enantiomer and not the other, what we call a symmetric synthesis or an anti-selective synthesis. And, uh, you know, it was a totally irrelevant reaction in the context of biology, but conceptually demonstrated, co going back to Arthur's point, that there are conditions that we, with crystals, with the reduction of entropy that you do have, and other properties like self-seeding, you can, under normal conditions, generate a large excess of molecules that are chiral, that are only one-handedness and not both. And that might be important in the origins of life, who knows? I think that's yeah. full circle. <laughs> I'd like to thank the audience for your participation, and we'd all like to thank you, Miguel, for spectacular and inspiring talk. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everybody.